We are going on a security theme around here, and this talk will be summing up my experiences of pen testing, because I actually do that as part of my day job. So yeah, my name is Dat. You don't need to pronounce it that. Let's just call me Dnet. And uh, I co-founded a company that mostly does pen testing. And the the approach we take is we use automated tools, but only as part of a methodology where those tools are are employed by intelligence, intelligent and experienced humans who can evaluate the output of those tools and uh, iterate by running other tools. And usually as part of this methodology, we hit the walls, where the walls which are created by what current tools can do. And, and I guess when people are saying that, yeah, machines are taking our jobs, and, and the IT guys are ignorant because they are not affected. Well, what the fuck? We are the most affected. Our tooling has been evolving since decades. And, and I guess the whole difference between a script kitty and a hacker is the mere fact that a hacker can always produce tools and share it with the community because, you know, uh, just clicking on the buttons which were made by someone else is what defines the script kiddie. Or in Hammerdeal, we call them appliance operators. So we all know that feeling when we open some web page during a pen testing and find some web application which was probably installed by an admin who was tasked to do that. And he no longer works for the company. It was not uh, installed from, from Package Manager because that's just lazy. Or it was installed from Package Manager, but the Package Manager is no longer used for updating the system. And these applications are complex. Thus, they contain the potential for bugs. And since they are well known, it's often just a matter of Googling the name of the product to get already uh, published uh, exploits. But even if it's not the fact, and you see that there are no uh, exploits, you still want to have a feeling of what the version number is, because then you can download the source code, if it's available, and start digging around. And for example, in that case, if you look at uh, PHP my admin and the version is 446, you can see that it has some pretty severe vulnerabilities like uh, uh, for example, the second one from the bottom has a CVS score of 7.5, so it can be used to bypass authentication for remote attackers without any kind of authentication. So these are fun applications to have around on your servers. The problem is that when you, for example, open the changelog.php file and you realize that it's not available, you get the same login page. So while there are files which could be used to determine the version, so it's not even fingerprinting, it's about uh, outright telling what version I'm running, for example, because the readme or changelog has the version number in it, well, it's, it usually doesn't work because some security-minded administrators or package maintainers decided to remove this information, which is kind of a good part. Uh, but then again, this is where we need some tooling. Because, of course, if you look at the source code that is sent to the browser as a web application, you can see that there are many references to certain files, which some of which are Gener might not be generated uh, dynamically on demand. So for example, in this case, if you look at, there is .php files, uh, which are referenced. These are probably generated dynamically, so it's not a good candidate to use it as fingerprinting a certain version. But for example, here's favicon.ico, that is probably a, a static file, or PNG file. So there is the possibility to find enough files that can be used as, as a as a pinpoint, a kind of constraint to find which exact version is running on the server. And this is my basic idea. So if I take, for example, in this case, I take three files, one PNG, one CSS, and one JavaScript file, 
and I look at the, I, I represent their contents as their SHA hash, for example, in this case, and I see in which release which, which contents were packaged because you can usually ex have access to this kind of information from the SCM, the source code management systems, let it be Git subversion or something else. And for example, in this case, you see that the 500PNG was this EF11 blah, blah, blah value. So you know that the version must be at least 2.1. But that's not enough for you because it, it, it's, it's still really wide. And then you see, OK, 52.css has the hash value of B2E5 blah, blah, blah. And that also applies to five versions. But the intersection of these two now only is these two releases called uh, 2.1 and 2.1.1. And then you find the third file, which has been changed over the time, several times to this value, which was absurd. And the only intersection of these three values, which matches our observations, is this 2.1. So you do this, you get the thing. So this is something that can be done by hand, which is exactly like translating source code from C to assembly can be done by hand, but we usually find these tasks which are ripe for automating because we usually deal with this. And the thing most software projects use to nowadays is Git. And, um, I'd like to tell you how Git works because I think it's simple, but as it seems, other people have the, the assumption that Git is problematic. So for example, this guy tells you that Git gets easier once you get the basic idea that branches are homeomorphic and the functors mapping submanifolds of a Hildebert space. I know some of those words, for example, easier. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's become a classic, but, but still, I'd like to tell you just the bare, bare uh, minimum about Git internals to, to understand how my project works. So on the left side of the screen, you can see some Git commands which I issued to create a simple repository. So first I initialized an empty repository, and then I created two directories called A and B. Then I created two files alpha and beta in the appropriate directories with the contents foo and bar. I committed these changes in the second block, those five commands, and then I changed uh, the, the scene by adding a second file to the B directory called bravo, and then committed that as a second revision. And on the right side, you can see how the, the, the repository looked after I issued the, all these commands. So in Git, you have uh, four kinds of objects. You have tags, which are basically, uh, if you've been here at the backup talk, you may remember the dogs and leashes kind of, kind of uh, parallel. Yeah, in this case, uh, the tag is just a name that we attach to a commit. So when we have branches, they are just practically tags which are automatically moved when you commit to a certain branch, so it always points to the latest commit. You can also have tags for, for marking specific versions of your software, so like uh, version 1, version 1.1, version 2, and these are all just hard links in file systems, usually we would call them by that name. So we could, we could just skip them and use the, the hashes instead, but it gives you a human-friendly interface. And then you have commits, which are essentially snapshots of the, of the repository at certain points of time. And I, I marked them with these green, green ellipses. And it points to a so-called tree. Trees are essentially like in file systems. They contain a list of names. And these names can either point to other trees, so you can create hierarchical structures of directories, you could say, or they could point directly to so-called blobs. A blob is a content of the file. It's just, as the name suggests, so a binary large object. So it's just, just a bunch of bytes. And as you can see, Git tries to 
tries to cut down on file size and improve performance by trying to merge things that look like the same in different revisions. So for example, the file called beta is the same in both commits, so they, so they kind of point to the same uh, bar uh, blob. Also, the alpha directory hasn't changed in the second commit, uh, based on the first commit. So it can reuse the same, the same uh, tree object already used in the first commit. So basically, this is what you need to know to, to understand how to, how to go into the tree programmatically and extract the kind of information needed for this fingerprinting. So you can actually look inside Git to use this. So while there are some components designed for human consumption, you can, you can easily dig into this stuff so you can see what is the, the ID of the tree. Git uses SHA-1 hashes to identify objects. Thus, if you have two, two equal objects, they will be merged into one. So it's also known as a content addressable storage. And then you can see how, how a tree looks. So it has an A and a B, which, are, which point to other trees. And then, then a tr the, the last tree, which was called, for example, in this case, uh, B, B, it points to two blobs, Beta and Bravo. And if, if I like to see how, for example, the, the, this ID was generated, for blobs, it pretty, it's pretty easy because it's the string blob a space, and the number of bytes, it's all encoded in ASCII, and then a zero terminator, and then just the contents of the bytes. So since I use the echo command, it has a new line at the end, and if I point, if I uh, pipe it into SHA-1, you can see that I got the same result. So this is basically how Git works, and we need to understand it because if uh, we want to traverse this tree of, of objects in Git, what do we have? We have the file contents which we observe on the server. So for example, in my case, I opened, I fired up a browser, and as you can see, I, I first loaded the, the root, and then my, then my browser loaded all these other components referenced, and of course, if I look at the response, I have all the things that have came back as responses from the server. And in this case, I can easily compute these hashes because I know the length, I know the contents, so the blob hash can be easily computed. So now I don't even have to have to go through all the blobs. Now I just have to go through all the tree objects and look where these objects, these blob objects has been referenced before, and then I can do my stuff. And that leads to a really interesting thing. So in the beginning, I was thinking about, well, it's going to be different because Look here, it's really easy. It was running on localhost because it was just, just a proof of concept. And, whoa, okay. So I, it was just running on localhost and, uh, and I installed it in the root directory. But what if it's installed in some kind of subdirectory, especially since languages like PHP prefer to map the URL routing into the, the file system, which is a bad idea, but that's for another ranting talk. So because of this, it would be problematic to discover how the, the, the file passes match up. But then I realized the pass doesn't even matter. If I have the hash that uniquely identifies the file, so I, I don't even have to deal with this stuff. And you know, it's, it's the best thing about uh, starting a, a research project like that, that when you realize that you have problems which are not even problems, you can just skip them. And, and it's really good because you, you accomplished your goal and you didn't have to work for that part, which is awesome. So yeah, I, uh, what I tried to implement it. The problem was that Burp Suit, which we essentially use for all web projects, because yeah, there are other projects like Zap and and uh, Mitten Proxy and other things. The and, and in the end, we we always realize that yeah, but Burp has that one thing I need, so I will not have to run two programs to get the results. So Burp is used, and it can run run uh, plugins written in Python and Ruby, but it doesn't even matter because 
those are JRuby and Jython. So you still have to use idiotic Java stuff, but you don't even get the the great thing about uh, Java, which is uh, the compiling step, because you have to test it inside Burp. So if I have to every time manually load the plugin to check if I manage to mistype something in a Python or Ruby source code, I'm going to have to pull all my hair out. Because a compiler is much faster than going into Burp's UI and trying to click through all those checkboxes and the damn UI. So yeah, I had to use Java, but yeah, well. So to get tools for that, I looked for a library which can use Git, and JGit is pretty good. It's BSD licensed, and it can access all the things that needed that is needed to to go through a Git repository. And I tried to decouple the whole design, so so all this UI and the logic is separated. So there is a standalone console version which can be invoked directly and doesn't require burp. So it's it's not a burp specific plugin, but it can be used with burp. So when you when you invoke it as a burp plugin, you get a nice swing uh, graphical user interface, and that's I think it's a best of both worlds. But then of course this whole idea could be implemented in any language, and. Uh, yeah, this is this is a great part where I try to show off how it works. So demo time. So as you see, I loaded some files, and uh, I'm not sure why it behaves that way. Maybe if I put it to full screen, maybe it's better. So if you install the plugin, you get a new menu point called Find Version from Git, and uh, then you just have to find which which uh, directory the, the git repository is in, and then it starts traversing the whole tree, and it's it's huge. And it says the specific files are present in 68 commits, and it even prints you the first and the last one, so that you can see how narrow it managed to make, because the number of commits is not necessarily a good measure, because some projects have big commits, some, some squash them into smaller ones, so the time frame is a bit better, so we can see that the server is running the versions really somewhere between August of uh, 2016 and February 2017. So if I close this window, I can just simply select more files. And this way, it will just use all of them. And let's see what it gains me. You see, it was a bit faster because it had all these lots of small files cached into the hard drive again. And now the specified files are present in one commit. Yeah, I haven't fixed the S. So now it's a bit easier and 86B32. And if I just, sorry, wrong screen. And if I just, uh, yeah, 444FDB. If you look at it, 86B32, it says, Mm. Yeah, I should. One year, nine months ago. I'm not sure why it's. Yeah, it seems if you look at it. Uh, yeah, it seems like I checked out another commit. So it managed to find it. Uh, only, yeah, just a sec. Demo effect is always great. Why can't I find this? Okay. Well, it managed to show you something. <laughs> so, um, As you can see, it reported some blobs that were not in the repository. If you look at it, it's it's probably the fourth one, which is a minified JavaScript. So probably the source code repository only contained the original largified JavaScript. But the great thing is that we just we can just skip this, and I'm going to talk about these these nice little tricks that I learned. Uh, throughout, but first let's talk about the bad parts. So many things could be better about this. Uh, so first of all, 
Let's say you have an output that says, yeah, I didn't manage to narrow the thing, so you have 300 commits which are all potential candidates, and, uh, and they are for three years' worth of development. So a good thing would be to look into the Git repository and pick five paths which could narrow it down a bit because you have all the statistics uh, available in the Git repository, meaning which files uh, changed the most uh, times so that it, you can pick the ones which, which would narrow it down more precisely. Also, I, since Burp can issue HTTP requests, it could do it, and it, even it could do it automatically. So you you don't even need to you wouldn't even need to do something. You just say, yeah, I want more more better results, and it would just do it. Also, it's it's hard to hard to uh, hard to transform a commit ID to a version, and git describe is something that makes it much easier. So for example, in this case, I have this ID, and I just say git describe this, and it will just say, yeah, it's 1.2.2, and it's 27 commits from 1.2.2, and after a G, it has the original ID. And it's probably, yeah. It's probably why I can see that the commit that was checked out was 1.2.2, and this is also a commit from 1.2.2. So probably around release, they after they bumped up, they added some stuff, so it found this version. But if you don't know Git Describe, it could display it. So it's, for example, a really good first first commit for someone who wanted to get into this stuff. Also, the user friendly is not the user interface is not very friendly. So if you looked at it, it has some some uh, progress bar and then just a text area where I just dump all my log lines because it's a kind of like scratching my own each project. So it worked for me, worked for the use case I needed to use it for, and yeah, it 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 could be better, but. It also needs a cool name and the logo. So I actually, I, I developed the logo, but it could use a better one. But it also needs a cool name. So right now, if you look at it, it just say find version from Git repository in, in the menu, find version from Git. And also in the extender, it just says uh, Git version. Uh, that's not, not, very, not very cool, but yeah. If you can come up with something, I'd be glad. Also, things I've learned about during the development. It seems that uh, you, you see the whole thing is a recursive traverse of the tree because you start from the master branch and you start going through all the commits and then you have to go through all the trees. And it seems that uh, I had this commit called is hashing tree, which uh, the three the ellipses, the three dots, just say that there are more lines in this function. But within this function, it calls itself, so it's a recursive function. And it seems that uh, we could move all these these parameters. So, for example, in in uh, in, in one of those Java best practices books, they say if you have more than three function arguments, you should consider moving those into the object because you are doing it wrong. Well, I have, as you can see, five function arguments. So I said, yeah, sure, why not? Just, you know, make it a simple method and reference these things from the instance. And then it became eight times slower. So it seems that the idiotic thing of Java, that everything is a pointer, so you, you don't really have stack, uh, stack variables only for primitive types. That means that all these memory indirections led to, in real world usage, an eight times slowdown. So now it's a static, and it gives you all these, uh, it gives all these parameters to its uh, descendants, but it works. Also, the method name of the week goes to this guy. Because uh, yeah, dispose buddy. That's that's a great great uh, function name. Yeah, it's it it was really useful because as it turned out, we don't really need to know anything about those commits we find. The commit ID is enough. So if you call this dispose buddy, it uses much less memory. But I still like the way they named it. 
And uh, this thing that made the most impact on, in, on performance, and this is in line what many of, of the people in the computing science field say, that if the algorithm is, is good, then it's, it's the best optimization as opposed to trying to make micro-optimizations on the implementation side. So if we go back to this, this little template, if you look at this, after the first file, I know that only the last five commits can be used. So in this case, from these commits, I shouldn't even test the top three because those were, those were dropped at the first file. So in this case, I, can, I marked it with red that you can just safely ignore all these commits. And in case of the second file, you can also drop the ones that were not present in the second column. So three other commits that shouldn't be tested because here it's marked with green, so you should be tested, right? No, it's... So evaluating this intersection operate, operation between several sets, is, it's, it's much, much faster to evaluate it uh, using eager evaluation. So yes, after the second intersection, I shall only work on, on the things that were present in the sets before and not producing large sets and then perform an intersection on them. So this took down, if you know, this, this big O notation. Because instead of uh, multiplying the number of commits with the number of files, we can just do it uh, using the number of comments because you are narrowing it down pretty fast. The other thing is edge cases, which is interesting. So the first one on the left, um, yeah, it needs some explanation. Uh, on the left, you can see after the first two files, we are done to one commit. So there can be no other commit that can match. So Think about what could happen afterwards. If there is something that says that this commit is not a good candidate, then it didn't even matter because we fucked up. And even the, on the best case, it can just confirm that, yes, that's the only commit that could survive. So now we have some detection in place that if the number of, uh, number of potential commits is one, so yeah, I could just show you the code itself. So, mm, yeah, I think, yeah. So if the size is less than two, then we break. And why, why less than two? Because that's the first edge case. When it's, when it, when it's exactly one, then that commit is the, in the, is the candidate, so you can just skip everything. On the other hand, if you have a file, that, has, that doesn't match any of the commits, for example, because it was dynamically generated, then it would, it would result in, in an empty set, which is not very convenient. So right now we say that, okay, in this case, we, we, just, skip, we just skip that file. And that, that's, wh that's why we use the, the uh, smaller than two, because that covers the zero and the one case as well. So, this is something that worked for me, but it needs more field testing. So if you could test this application and, and see if this algorithm is okay, then I would be very, very grateful because it's just, this was built on a hunch and the works for me basis, but I know that that's not what good software development is. Also caching was really, really great because, uh, we can form two sets, trees that directly or indirectly contain the blob if we're looking for. So, for example, uh, if in this case we are looking for cooks, it's contained in Bravo, and then it's it contained in this tree, and then it's contained in this tree, so we don't have to, to test those again because if it's contained somewhere down the line, we don't need to traverse that again. So we can just say that, yeah, I've seen this tree, it contains it, we don't need to go down. And it also means that if it doesn't contain it, uh, then we also don't need to check for it because it won't change. That's, that's how Git works. So 
Yeah, these are described here uh, with nice mathematical notations for those who are into this kind of fetish. And the third one is, a, is an observation that uh, the trees that contain the blob have, have a much, much smaller, smaller uh, size than the, than the ones which don't contain. I think it's pretty obvious. Uh, so because of this, this whole caching thing is done in this, in this, uh, in this order. So, 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 so where is it? Yeah. If, um, yeah, where is this? Yeah, so I call this known to be free of and known to contain. Obviously, contain the blob that we are looking for. So more likely to happen. So first we test for this, because this is usually the case. And then we just say continue and go to the next iteration in this while loop. And if it knows to contain, then we can just return true, because no matter how we run, it, it will all be, be true. always be true. And of course, everything is up on GitHub. Uh, the license is MIT because I'm not good at licenses. And of course, pull requests are welcome. I made a logo, but you can also make a better one. The, the orange thing is the logo of Git, which is superimposed on HTTPS. So you can just grab the source code and do whatever you want to do with it. And yeah, I'd be really grateful about pull requests or just feedbacks about what works for you and what not. So this was it. Thank you for your attention. <laughs> Questions? Nice approach. Thanks. Yeah. I got another edge case for when static files are moved into being dynamically generated. This is being skipped out of your current Git tree traversal. What, what do you mean because exactly? When, when, when I'm generating a JavaScript from a static file and the developer decides to, well, let's make this generic, then you're hitting a, a rock bottom where it's actually being still existing. But you, you might get the same output of different result. Oh, you mean that something is is there in more than one version, but only accessible in certain versions over the web? Yeah. Yeah, but it's yeah, it's it's really hard because you are working black box, so you know nothing of the server. So yeah, the, these are the kind of roadblocks that I hit. Yeah. So I understand that this is based on Burp, and I think there's a there's a good thing about this that just by browsing the site, Burp automatically can identify this, but if you are like going proactively, you can go for certain files that are super um, informative about this. For example, Drupal has changelog.txt, and you should, uh, if you, or you do that. Yeah, that, that was the main motivation. Many no, no, distributions. No, no, no. You go for the txt file of Drupal. It is in the, in, the, in the web root, like where all the PHP files are. Yeah, but that's what I'm saying. Many distributions remove these files precisely for the reason that they can be used for fingerprinting. OK. So, but there is um, files that you never browse while by browsing the site. And uh, there are some, like, uh, I don't know, I have a list of those, because I have implemented the same without work a few years ago. And uh, you can find. And the, the other thing that I was wondering is, um, like really old and rusty code is not in Git anymore. Or never yeah. reported. We don't well, care about that. Yeah, we usually find things that that are using this. And yeah, you, you mentioned a good point. Actually, uh, on down below, there's also to do. If we could do persistent caching so that we could just make an SQLite database about which versions match which uh, blobs, then we can just do like rainbow tables that we can release files for each of these really popular PHP applications like, like Squirrel Mail or PHP MyAdmin Drupal or something. 
and then we can just say that yeah, here's the database and you load it and it and it loads even faster. I mean, even in this case, the the I'm proud because it runs so fast, even though this round cube thingy has has a Git directory which is 50 megabytes, which doesn't sound that bad, but it means that it's compressed and it's still 50 megabytes, even though the whole checkout is only 20 megabytes. So it's it's crazy how many objects it does have. Um, I'm not sure if I can if it it's already been packed. Um, yeah, it's already been packed. Mech. The other thing that I uh, when I was doing this, I was downloading all the source code control repositories. And I say not Git because most of them back then were still in subversion or worse. Joomla, for example. Yeah. Uh, and I was only handling Drupal, Joomla, Magento, Media, Wiki, OS, Kumas, Typo3, and WordPress. And all the repos downloaded was like three or four gigabytes yeah. in total, so it's fucking huge. How many, how many repos do you support, and how big is, uh, what is your experience with this? Well, as you can see now, I printed that this round cube thingy has yeah, 10,000 comets, and all those comets refer to lots of files, so that's why having being this fast is, is actually considered an achievement. And we support everything, so this is a pretty generic stuff. You just, you just browse into the Git repository and use the hashes, so it's, it's not tied to, to Roundcube. So nothing here is Roundcube specific. Only the fact that it uses Git, but many other stuff uses Git. So, repository somewhere you can use Git SVN to yes. import that into a Git repository. That as well. And then use Git from there. Yeah, actually, I I met developers who said that they have to use SVN, but Git merging is so good that they are using Git to manage their SVN repositories to do merges. So, yeah, Git SVN is is pretty good. I I use that as well. So, uh, do you uh, how do you have encountered any cases where this was not able to identify something? Not yet. Okay. Uh, have you considered using like something like SSD for something for also for identifying partial matches? Not yet, because this this primitive thing worked so well. So that that's why I'm saying that I need more more real world. Uh, experience with this because just because it worked for my use cases doesn't mean that it's perfect and covers all everybody's uh, needs. Yeah. Mm, I think you can extend it to check plugins or something. Yes. And, and even configurations. Uh, that has uh, some yeah, but, 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 yeah, but for those, there are pretty good projects already. So what this is good at is being generic. And those plugin thingies, those are pretty much, you know, hard to... Yeah, and for example, VP scan, WP scan is actually pretty good at that. So I... I it, it would be a waste of time to make something that already exists and is pretty good at that. Do you, do you have? Um, do you have any ideas for how to, uh, or what kind of countermeasures against this kind of scanning you could uh, take? I could imagine that for many kind of, kinds of um, text-based file formats, you could could just have your HTTP server add a random number of space characters or something so that the Sure, but I, I wouldn't add any countermeasures because it's it's not the point. That that's like uh, instead of healing healing an illness, healing the symptoms. So so this is for this is not a yeah, I should have prefixed this talk with 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 this kind of warning that this is about information gathering. This is not, not a direct attack. I learn what version you are running. I just gained some information, but that should not be enough to attack the server because in an ideal world, these applications would be on the latest version. 
And you already have some isolation on the server if you don't trust PHP applications, and why would you trust them? So yeah, like using Suho Sin for PHP and running all this stuff in under separate users, harden your kernel with, with GR security or something like that. So I, I think there is no point in wasting time counteracting what I'm doing here. But of course, yeah, like removing uh, readme is, and change logs is a good first step, which many people already do. But yeah, you could introduce subtle changes, but then again, what would be the point? You could spend that time on, on much more hardening measures, much better hardening measures. Anything else? Okay, then the next talk will be in 10 minutes. Thank you. <laughs>